It was August 15, 1957, a summer camp in Wingdale, New York. The witness, Paul Geller, and seven other campers had been sent to bed early as punishment by the camp counselor after they had snuck off together without telling anyone earlier in the day. While in the cabin, at around 10 p.m., Geller and some of the boys realized that the counselor that was supposed to be keeping an eye on them had sneaked off to go watch a late basketball game. Despite this, possibly because they were tired, they elected to remain in their beds in their darkened cabin, watching the forest through the window and chatting. The beds faced a large screen window, and they had a pretty good view of the trees and the sky. Suddenly, as they quietly talked, something strange caught their attention above the trees. A round light seemed to blink on. It remained hovering there for some time, blinking on and off, before eventually drifting away out of the view of the boys. Intrigued, some of the boys chatted with each other about what it might have been. Within five minutes, two more objects appeared on the scene, blinking and going in different directions, sideways and up and down. Soon they also disappeared from view. By now, all of the boys were huddled, looking out the window. Within minutes, five more glowing, blinking lights appeared. They also disappeared from view after a period of time. The boys stayed up watching the window, but nothing else happened, and they returned to their beds and went to sleep. Paul Geller found himself too excited to sleep, and he remained there, laying in his bed staring out the window long after his friends had drifted off to sleep. Suddenly, without a sound, and seemingly from out of nowhere, a bright, luminous, glowing, circular disc lit up above the trees. It was about a hundred feet away. Geller could see five lights in a circular, clockwise configuration surrounding the disc. He tried to sit up, but claims that he felt almost paralyzed as his eyes locked on to the strange object. As he lay there, something almost indescribable occurred. Instead of seeing the milky white glowing underbelly of the aerial craft surrounded by five white glowing lights, this image was replaced or superimposed by a sideways cutaway view of the inside of the object. Geller likened it to watching a movie. He noticed that the UFO had a circular viewing screen. Surrounding the viewing screen was a circular control panel. Sitting in two large bucket seats next to each other and facing the viewing screen were the craft's pilots. Though these pilots looked anything but human, for sitting there were two massive hairy creatures. Geller had a near perfect view of the creatures. He described that they were between 9 to 10 feet tall, had golden tan orange long shaggy furry hair, long arms and legs, stooped shoulders and pink circles around their eyes. They seemed to be wearing goggles that covered up about three-fifths of the pink circles. Their feet were huge and pink with large toes. One to three foot long shaggy golden tan hair covered their legs. Each creature grasped and clenched a narrow rectangular control bar protruding approximately two feet out of the floor with its two feet. In unison each pumped the two bars that were level to the floor like an organ pedal. Up and down and up again over and over as they watched the witness and their view screen. The creature closest to Geller's point of view slowly turned 90 degrees and looked directly at him. He seemed to stare at Geller for a period of time, and Geller was able to examine him. He had the appearance of a super intelligent Borneo orangutan. He had a huge mouth and two long fangs protruding from the upper jaw. Geller could see piercing blue eyes through the clear goggles. Geller had trouble describing what happened next, only that he got the sense that the creature was somehow connecting to him, like he was inside his mind. The second creature, the one further away, was looking at Geller, though on the main view screen. Geller could see the screen and see himself lying in the bed. The second creature continued to pump the long narrow bar in and out of the floor with its pink feet. Suddenly the visual connection terminated. 
He was again staring at the glowing undercarriage of the craft. Two seconds later, the craft, without a sound, disappeared from view. Geller was able to move again, and he woke his fellow campers and told them of his experience. At the time, Geller had no idea what the creatures inside the craft might have been, but in the years since the incident, he began to hear stories of a large, hairy, bipedal creature scaring campers and loggers in the Pacific Northwest. To him, the creatures he saw that night inside the craft very much resemble these Bigfoot creatures so often talked about. There are a large number of Bigfoot researchers who absolutely will not entertain the notion that these creatures might be somehow linked to the UFO phenomenon, though cases like Paul Geller's suggest that the possibility at least exists that these Bigfoot creatures might actually come here from somewhere else. Knot Hill Reservoir is a part of Ashton Underline to the east of Manchester in England. It was decommissioned by Northwest Water in the late 1970s and has since become a popular spot for hikers and those looking to do some fishing. It also has a dark history. In October 1936, an unemployed collier named Arthur Dawson took his own life by drowning. On Monday, July 21, 2008, a hiker stumbled upon the bodies of 17-year-old Lee Flanagan and 18-year-old Craig Finn floating in the reservoir. Apparently, the teens were looking to get in a little swimming before doing some fishing later that day. Somehow, the pair had got caught up in the weeds and drowned. A memorial set up for the pair had to be removed due to vandalism a week later. The reservoir also had its share of UFO sightings over the years, though the weirdest event would take place one summer morning in 2012, when a person stumbled upon something in a field that shouldn't have been there. It was Sunday, August 28, 2012, 5.15 a.m. The witness, no name given, had gone out for an early morning hike around the Knot Hill Reservoir. The hiker kept their eyes on the sun as it was just barely peeking over the trees. It was a beautiful sight and well worth getting up extra early to see. The witness carried on with their walk, soon coming upon a gated area in the woods. They sensed something was off. They stopped briefly and peered through the gate into an adjacent field. They were astonished to see four huge interlock windows sitting there in the grass. They immediately assumed it was some kind of building. The area surrounding the reservoir was not meant to be developed at all, and from what they could remember there was no building there, and never had been. So where did it come from? Who built it? How did they construct it so fast? The witness asked himself. Staring into the windows, the witness could see rows and rows of what looked like ordinary, normal people, working on some kind of assembly line. Suddenly one of the windows opened and a man's head popped out. He gruffly shouted, You're not supposed to be here. Go home. The witness felt immediate fear. His words, go home, were clearly meant as a command rather than a polite request. They sensed that if they remained there any longer, something terrible would happen. The witness quickly retreated, running as fast as they could. They didn't stop until they reached home. Still shook up by the experience, the witness checked the mapping app on their phone, along with satellite photos, and saw that the field should indeed have been empty. Later in the day, the witness, still frightened by what had happened, managed to convince two friends to accompany them back to the field. When they arrived there, they found that it was empty. It was just a normal field. No building, no people. A quick search of the spot where the building had been sitting revealed nothing. They found nothing to indicate that anything of an immense size had been sitting there, nor did they find any trace of construction equipment. It was truly bizarre, and the witness had no way of explaining it. But what was it exactly that they had seen? The witness noted that it looked like four large interlocked windows. Inside there were seemingly normal looking people milling about apparently hard at work on something akin to an assembly line, almost like what one would see inside of a factory. In his book Strange Manchester, author Adrian Finney postulated a number of theories regarding what the witness might have glimpsed that morning, including a possible neighboring dimension or multiverse. 
one where the area around the reservoir was industrialized, and the witness, briefly glimpsed through a thinning veil between the worlds, was suspected of trespassing. Finney also suggests that it might have been a time slip, noting that the building sounded very modern. He thought possibly that the witness had peered across the vastness of time and observed things yet to be, and that sometime in the not too distant future, a factory would be built on that land. Whether it was another dimension, another time, or something else altogether, it does seem that, for a brief moment, this witness not only stared at, but interacted with the beyond.